broadcasting live and worldwide. Here's Brody Brazil. I am pretty sure this episode qualifies into the emergency podcast category. It's just a crazy thing that nobody saw coming here on a Wednesday. I woke up, I checked Twitter. It had just gone official. I I had no clue this was happening. It was all a shock to me. In fact, I scrolled and swiped and searched over and over to make sure I was not still actually dreaming. Peter DeBoer is now head coach of the Las Vegas Golden Knights. They have parted ways with Gerard Gallant. That is just absolutely amazing. The last time I did an emergency podcast, it was because Pete was dismissed by the Sharks. That was back on December 11th. And here we are a month and a couple days later. He is already re-employed. And the irony here is that Gerard Gallant last year in the playoffs, round one, things started to trend away from Las Vegas. They took a a 3-1 stranglehold on that round one series. All of a sudden, the Sharks win a couple games. He's trying to draw attention to himself, get it off his players. He calls Pete DeBoer a clown. Well, now Pete DeBoer is replacing Gerard Glant. So, don't mean to get too personal about stuff like that. I understand there was some there was some gamesmanship back then, but that's just the irony. You call a guy a clown, and then less than a year later, he's replacing you. I really want to title this episode, Las Vegas Did What? And it's because of two different fronts. I mean, number one, who saw this coming? Who saw the dismissal of Gerard Glant? A Las Vegas team that obviously had the Cinderella story in their inaugural season going all the way to the Stanley Cup final. And there was those those tragic shootings in Southern Nevada to start off their season and their existence. And that town rallied around a hockey team. And it's it was very t- touching and heartwarming and sentimental. And, you know, that was that was quite the sports story. It really was. And you know what? Getting ejected in round one of last postseason, there's there. Yeah, there is some shame in that. But I, I really want to say there is kind of no shame in that. So many teams in this league don't even make the playoffs. You're two for your first two in making the postseason. You're not even still supposed to be there. So, you know, I I feel like in another respect, the, the Las Vegas fan base, you have to be shocked by this because you created such a culture there with your team, your players, your coaching staff. There must have been something going wrong, if not already wrong, in those relationships. And I'm not, I'm not here to, you know, completely speculate on that with any type of detailed knowledge. I'm just, I'm sitting on the outside saying, you know, you don't have that type of success in your first two seasons. And even where they're at right now, which I'll get to in just a second, I mean, you know, who would have, who would have thought Las Vegas would have dismissed a guy that's so deeply ingrained in their franchise And then who would have seen that Pete DeBoer, of all people, would be the guy to change teams but stay in the same division, and it all happens, you know, a month and four days apart. Um, When Gallant was dismissed, and and like I said, I found this out kind of half awake this morning, my mind instantly went to bad places, right? Because we've seen recently a couple NHL coaches dismissed due to off-ice issues, and I I didn't suspect any of that with Gallant, but, you know, it just gets your mind aroused. You're like, well, wait a second, you know, what must have happened here? Was this, was this, was this really hockey related? This is a Las Vegas team that is still very much competitive this season. They have always been competitive in their prior two years. So, in a good way, right, it had nothing to do with off-ice stuff, but in a weird way, it had everything to do with their performance, which, I didn't think was that far off. So let's let's get to the firing of Glant. Uh, again, a team that was, is, not was, is on the brink of the playoffs. Las Vegas right now, and it's a, it's a busy top half of the division in the Pacific. Unfortunately, the Sharks are not in that mix, but Las Vegas is one of, what, five teams right at the top, and they're three points out of the division lead. This is 
They have a plus goal differential. This is not necessarily a struggling Las Vegas team. I do understand they've lost four in a row. I do understand they've been streaky this year. I wonder if some of that and some emotions came with a decision like this. But again, there is some track record. There's a consistent group. It's not like there's been a ton of turnover. So it makes you wonder the mindset of Las Vegas as a hockey franchise and maybe even to a deeper extent as a hockey community. Some people suggested this word entitled today on social media. I saw that a few times. Entitled in a sense of what I was talking about before, you're two for your first two in terms of making the playoffs in seasons. And in the first year, you went all the way to the last round. You were that close to a Stanley Cup in your first season. So the thought of being entitled, I understand it. I'm not here to say I completely agree with it, but I understand the the thought that looking at them, they think that they should be in the playoffs every year. And if they're not even in the mix completely here past the halfway point, that's not good enough. That is not up to their standards, which is ridiculous. I mean, you, you've, you've been a fan long enough or you've been part of the NHL long enough. You understand that there's going to be some highs and there's going to be some lows. There's also going to be some seasons of adversity at the beginning and at the middle that turn out just fine in the end. And that's obviously what Shark fans are hoping for. And there have been Sharks seasons like this before. Quite honestly, even the year they went to the Stanley Cup final, it was a fairly pedestrian regular season. So the entitlement factor, right? Does Las Vegas think they are actually so good that this is way below the bar they've set? I don't know. I could also say, right, let me change the the narrative here. Maybe they're just that hungry. Maybe they're willing to make major moves and decisions, and maybe they're going to be that type of franchise. Wouldn't seem like it so far, right? Because they've they've fairly kept a consistent core together. They've added to it even. They haven't, you know, sold off anybody. They haven't made a, a big unloading trade so far that didn't net anything great in return. So maybe they're maybe they're that hungry. But I think the real thing here is, and I'll, and I'll discuss the coaching carousel this season, already seven head coaches fired in the NHL, and we're barely past the halfway point. We haven't even got to the All-Star game yet, and seven coaches have been dismissed. But maybe this is part of being trendy, right? Think about the NHL. We've always known it to be a copycat league, right? Like in the early 2010s, hey, be like... The Chicago Blackhawks, or be like the LA Kings, be a hard, heavy team. Doesn't matter if you're the fastest. If you're physically imposing and you play a heavy puck possession game, that's going to get you a Stanley Cup. And then it kind of changed. Hey, be a be a fast team. You know, be like a Tampa. Um, you know, be a quick, speedy, small team, and that's going to get you the Stanley Cup, which is kind of the 180 of, you know, big and physically imposing and heavy. But maybe now the the copycat league has evolved to the front offices in the respective coaching changes. You know, like, what's the big deal? Our players are going to stay the same. We're going to try a coaching change here. Maybe, Maybe NHL front offices have realized that the risk they're taking in changing coaches has less downside and way more potential upside. I don't know. And I'm not, I'm not here to say that I even have an opinion on that. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it shouldn't and it does. (laughs) Sometimes it should work and it doesn't. So there you go. A couple couple different, you know, really deep thoughts on what it means that Las Vegas would dismiss Gallant just like that. On the flip side, now let's get to the other part of this. Again, I, I said it's Las Vegas did what? On two fronts fired Gallant, and hired Pete DeBoer. Now, I'm actually not shocked that a person like Pete was brought in. I mean, I wouldn't have been surprised if it was also Peter LaViolette. But Pete DeBoer taking advantage of what is definitely a good opportunity. Look, the Golden Knights, their roster, it's unique. It's not traditional in a sense of an NHL 
a star-laden team, a bunch of high-salary guys, and then the rest. You know, it's a very widespread, deep hockey team. They have a lot of, and and I don't say this disrespectfully, they have a lot of good second-line forwards. Like, they may have four lines worth of second-line forwards. Now, I know you're going to say, what about, you know, Wild Bill Carlson, Marchessault, so, and so on. But the the point being, yeah, there are some really good players too. I don't mean to take away from anybody individually. They just have a team with little weaknesses. And they're very solid, top to bottom. They really are. They drafted that way. They've maintained that way. So I don't, I don't blame Pete DeBoer one bit for wanting to take up this opportunity. It's interesting. It's compelling. Look, it is a job in the NHL, but he could have done far worse than taking the Golden Knights job. This is a pretty good one for him. I I can't lie about that. But it also makes for such a super interesting storyline. And unfortunately for all of us, there's no more head-to-head games this regular season between San Jose and Las Vegas. Wouldn't that have been something? I mean, as, as it stands right now, I'm taping this on a Wednesday night. Pete DeBoer is going to coach these Golden Knights tomorrow in Ottawa. Imagine flying into Ottawa today, like I'm sure he did, and kind of studying up. Well, he knows the Golden Knights, let's be honest. He already He's already seen them four times in person this year. But, you know, really getting a grasp on, okay, what am I getting into here? Who are my guys? How do I do this? How do I get them to the next level? But again, going back to the Sharks, no head-to-head games for them in Las Vegas this regular season. So if these two teams meet in the playoffs, I, I'm going to be honest, that is that is going to be a long shot just because of the paths both would have to take to get there. The fact that they'd both have to qualify in the same division and they'd have to probably beat somebody else in maybe rounds one or two to actually get to uh, each other. But that's going to be quite the quite the thing to watch when the Sharks do ultimately go up against DeBoer in Las Vegas. There's going to be so many personal connections there. You talk to Sharks players, um, they still have very fond memories of Pete. And, you know, most of the guys on the team, I should I don't even know if it's most, many guys on the Sharks right now were with the team when they went to the Stanley Cup Final. And Pete was a huge part of that in the spring of 2016 Uh, His first season with the club. And you know what? There are, like like I said, there's a lot of fond memories and there's a lot of respect still from Sharks players to Pete DeBoer. So unfortunately, we won't get to see this immediately, but it will happen down the road. And how about just the thought of all the former Sharks head coaches who remain in the Pacific Division? And I'll throw one out to start that you may not have even thought thought of or known about. Daryl Sutter right now is actually a coaching advisor in Anaheim for Dallas Eakins and the Ducks. So there's one. We know that Todd McClellan is in Los Angeles with the Kings, and now DeBoer is in Las Vegas with the Golden Knights. So three former head coaches going up against San Jose in one capacity or another in the Pacific Division. Okay, lastly here, the thing that just kind of blows my mind, I alluded to it earlier, the coaching carousel this season. Seven different head coaches already fired and were not even at the All-Star break. Mike Babcock in Toronto for hockey reasons. John Hines in New Jersey for, you know, blowing it up reasons. They needed a total change of scenery and pace. Can't really say in Toronto that that that's that's part of it. It might have been a culture thing um, in a sense of going with A lot of younger players, a lot of high contract in value and year commitment players, and maybe Mike Babcock, his style didn't mesh with that. I I don't know, right? Those are internal and personal decisions, and no matter what was ever said at a press conference, I'm trying to take it from, you know, what I really believe it to be. So hockey decision, hockey decision in Calgary, then you get into Bill Peters getting fired for... I guess I want to say some off-ice stuff. I know it was on ice, but really had less to do about uh, coaching performance than than personal actions in the past. Jim Montgomery also had some personal off-ice issues with the Dallas Stars, so that gets us to four coaches fired. Then Pete DeBoer on December 11th was dismissed by San Jose. Then Peter LaViolette 
was let go by the Nashville Predators, and that was a very similar move to what the Sharks did. Uh, a very respected coach, a team that was not out of playoff contention yet, but they were you know, kind of going in that direction. Um, and for Nashville, what, they're only on their third ever head coach right now. Barry Trotz was a long-timer there. LaViolette, I believe, was like DeBoer, what, four or five seasons in with the Preds. And now Gerard Gallant is the seventh head coach fired this season. Seven of 31 teams have changed their head coach this year. That's almost 25% of the league. Not just changing coaches for this season, changing coaches during this season. So, is this how it's going to go? Is this the new trend of the NHL? I don't think players are going to buy into having three different sets of coaches across three different sets of seasons. Nobody wants that. In the end of at the end of the day, consistency is going to win out. You're going to want to find your your coaches, you're going to want to give them the opportune time and see what happens. Let it run its course. But I will say that you know, maybe we're getting to an era of the NHL where this is just going to be something we notice. Coaches don't stay around for more than two or three years unless things are really taking huge strides forward. You would think that, you know, winning a Stanley Cup would buy you some poker chips. That's the way I always think of it. How many poker chips do you have stacked in front of you? Getting to a Stanley Cup final gets you some poker chips. Even getting to the Western final gets you some poker chips. Consistently getting to the playoffs, poker chips. Having good regular seasons, poker chips. So it's just amazing sometimes when you think there's a, a man with enough poker chips in front of him as a head coach, it turns out there may have been some things you didn't know and he gets dismissed. And I'll also say this, you look at those names, Babcock, Hines, DeBoer, LaViolette, Gallant, you know, were these men dismissed because of anything they did? I mean, lack of effort, lack of production, lack of imagination? Probably not. It all goes back to the players who didn't perform on the ice, and the coach is always the easiest position to change. That's only one person and some assistants, I realize that, but you, you, can't, you can't change your whole team overnight, but you can definitely change your coaching staff overnight hey that does it for this emergency edition of the podcast hope you enjoyed some of those thoughts and maybe you were thinking the same thing uh, find me on twitter and instagram as well as the youtube channel would love a subscription over there but until next time here on the podcast i'm brody brazil and yes that is my real name <laughs>